welcome to the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Board of Education meeting, February the 27th, 2018. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by an invocation. If you'll please all stand and remain standing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As you all know, we, um, as a nation, um, witnessed unspeakable um, pain on February the 14th as those in Parkland, Florida, really lost innocence that day. Um, and so to, to honor those who lost their lives that day and for those whose lives forever changed that day, please join me in a moment of silence. Lord, we just ask that you make us relentless in the pursuit of peace. For, Father, we know that you are a God of love. And let us hold on and remember that always. Amen. You may be seated. Board members, we have um, one change to our agenda um, this evening. Um, we would like to add a discussion item. Uh, that would be um, from our Director of Security, Jonathan Wilson, to discuss um, school safety measures in the district. That would, again, we would add that to our discussion items. Do I have a motion to approve that amended agenda? Right. Mr. Singletary, do I have a second? Second. Ms. Calvert-Hayes, all in favor? Wonderful. Motion carries. Agenda is passed. Um, we have some special recognitions this evening. First, I would like to call on Dr. Symington he recognizes the Kernelsville Lions Club and their vision screening program. Good evening, Chair Jones, Dr. Emery, members of the board. Uh, tonight it's my privilege to introduce and just to recognize the Kernelsville Lions Club, who is one of those partners who epitomizes one of the school district's priorities of intentionally partnering with school and parent uh, partners. Uh, the Kernsville Lions Club does vision screening and I think all of us recognize how important vision is to education and to whole life and whole health. So tonight it's my privilege to welcome back a familiar face, uh, Debbie Warren, who is a face from Southeast Middle School who served in this community for a long time. She is works with educational uh, services for the Kernsville Lions Club and she's joined by Joe Waugh who is the treasurer of the Kernsville Lions Club, and they provide services to students in Kernsville and Walkerham, and Debbie is going to share more about what they do. Thank you, it's nice to be back again. Uh, I had the privilege of serving 38 years of service with this organization, and then after I retired in 2010, you called me back for six more years. So technically, I am officially retired as of last year. But when I retired, one of the things that I wanted to do was to make sure that I was connected with what my passion is all about, was the children. And so the Kernsville Lions Club was a perfect fit. You have a lot of information. I am not gonna read all of that to you, but I am gonna point out some things for you. The Kernersville Lions Club is a civic and a service club with a special mission to support our community, especially our children, and the visually impaired. We do the school support in three different ways. We do vision screenings, community civic support, and scholarships. We contact 12 area schools in Kernersville and Walkertown and eight preschools to offer the vision screening if they would like for us to come in. We do this for first, third, fifth, and seventh grade students and preschoolers that are three, four, or five years old. We focus on aiding the visually impaired in a variety of ways, including the vision screening, but we also give financial support if that is needed 
for them to see an optometrist or even an ophthalmologist. And we also provide assistance if they need glasses. We also give each of the schools that allow us to come in and to work with them $400 just to do whatever they want to with any special project. We also have invested $10,000 for a pediavision. And this is a photo screening computer and it is done after a regular chart screening as well as working with special needs children, ESL children, and preschool children. And you'll hear more about that later. The Crossville Lions Club also promotes student community service with our Leo clubs at East High School, Glen High School, and Walkertown. We provide services by uh, having a Lions Club member being a support for each of the schools. We give each of the schools funds so that they can have snacks, t-shirts, field trip, anything that they need. They are also invited to attend one of our meetings and they're invited to participate in community service projects. Finally, we give each of those schools a $1,500 scholarship for each of the three high schools. Now back to the vision screening. For us to do this in a great way and to save on teacher instructional time, we need 25 volunteers for each school vision screening. The Lions Club members, we usually have about 12 that show up because we do this on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in, in September and in October. So there's a lot going on. But we also have PTA members. We invite them to come in. Some schools do not even have any, and other schools have plenty. So we have a solution for that also. The Kernersville Women's Club, we have two members that usually come for that. And again, our school nurses, if they can work it in their schedule, they come and help support this. So in lieu of the schools that cannot get all of the parent support, we invite churches to come. So it's a community support. The following churches that help out is First Baptist Church of Kernersville, Main Street Methodist of Kernersville, Union Cross Moravian, Bucker Hill Methodist, Marsh Chapel Methodist of Walkertown, Loves Methodist of Walkertown, and Sage Garden Methodist. Our community involvement also includes Dr. Amy Harper of Triangle Visions of Kernelsville, of optometrist, and Dr. Patrick Hageman, the ophthalmologist of Kernelsville. They're alerted that after we do the vision screenings, the parents may be coming to see them and if they need financial support, we're here to help the, uh, with the expenses, either with the exams or with classes. The Lion Club, we spend about $400 making sure that we have all of everything, the schools pay for nothing. We do the charts, we have the screening forms, we have the small cups to cover their eyes, we do the parent letters, we do the paper and ink for the printer for the Pediavision, and we usually screen about 3,000 or 3,200 students with about a 10% uh, referral rate. The penny of vision usually takes about 20 seconds, but if we need to give some information for a doctor's screening, that takes an extra minute. So again, we're going real fast, but we're very uh, succinct in what we're doing. The referral sheet and parent letter, letter in English and in Spanish is given to the school nurse or the guidance counselor to follow up. The PDF vision, it includes six different screenings and I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce all of those. You can read them on your own. So we have a past and we have a future. Our past is Cornerstone Vision screening started in 1995. It was with five schools and we had chart screening only. Now, we have screened over 50,000 Kernersville students, and they've gone through the screening program, but we have added the PDO vision, and that can look for six different problems. Um, we are currently working with the school supervisor nurse, Karen Jenkins, and the regional supervisor, Angela Sheets, and hoping that we can get our school nurses more involved with the screening process. Our future is to offer information training to other Lions Clubs, other civic clubs, or churches that would like to support the community. 
We'll be glad to show them how we set things up and we will let them even train them with a PD vision if they would like to adopt other schools. In addition to all of that, we give about $20,000 or more just to children in the Pernisville area and that's listed in your packet. So if you'll go real, real quick, the next sheet there is, this is how we organize our screening. This is the third page back. And we start in July and we go through October. Then there's two sheets. We do keep up with our data. Joe Wall does our spreadsheet. And we, so we know how many children we're screening for each school. We know the percentage that need help. And that helps us to help the schools in knowing what their needs are. The next sheet that you have is what we call the Pediavision Cheat Sheet, because we don't know how to pronounce all of that and what to do, but we have all of those. The next two sheets, Joe is going to have a personal testimony about his two grandchildren and how important the screening is. But you have a copy of the letter in English and in Spanish, and on the last page is the Colonel's Alliance Club annual local community given of $20,000 or more in addition to the vision screening. So we are doing a lot for our children, a lot for the community, and we appreciate you letting us come and share this. And I'm going to have Joe come and tell you a little bit as a personal testimony. Okay. Good evening. I uh, retired five years ago and joined the Kernersville Lions Club as a way to give something back to the community and became very interested in the Pedia vision that had just been purchased and took it upon myself to study and learn all that I could about the, uh, the instrument. In doing so, I, I, I guess I became anointed as the, the caretaker and leader of this group and, and I had it at my house. My grandkids were visiting and I needed to test out some things that I had been talking uh, with some of the engineers at corporate about. So I, I set the machine up and I tested my grandkids and they were uh, five and six years old at the time and one of them had a slight uh, uh, stigmatism which wasn't a big deal but my granddaughter was off the chart. I don't have that one here but I gave it to my son and, and daughter-in-law and they went back and a couple weeks later went to see a uh, ophthalmologist and right away they were referred to a specialist and she had a, a, a severe problem with her eyes that had to be treated before she lost sight in one eye. And uh, she's been under treatment now for four years. And if it hadn't been for that, she would have lost the sight in that one eye. Uh, hadn't, had not been detected. Fast forward four years and my daughter moves back to the area. Thank you. And uh, I tested her children. And again, one of them had a small issue and the other one, almost the identical thing. <coughs> and uh, after he had been to the doctor and they gave him his glasses, he, he said, Mommy, I can see. So I just wanted to, to share that with you because it's not just my four grandchildren, it's 3,300 kids in the Walkertown, Kernersville, area that we do every year and I'm sure there are testimonies pertaining to those that we find there so thank you for your time so you can both come come back up as you can I had the um, opportunity several years ago to um, to fill in as one of those volunteers at one of the screenings, I think it was at Kernersville Middle School, and um, knowing um, Debbie as a former teacher and administrator, there was a well-organized plan. Um, there was no, no time wasted, um, <laughs> and so it was very efficient and uh, lots of, uh, I guess it was event management, classroom management, and you had the volunteers and, and kids in and out. But on behalf of the board, we want to thank you um, for what you do for our students each and every year for um, really changing the way that they um, that they could enjoy school I can't imagine um, you know with a few um, 
age my, my birthdays kind of go up. I've started wearing glasses here in the last couple of years. So it, it, it makes such a difference. So thank you for caring and giving back in all the ways that you listed um, on behalf of the, the Lions Club. And then um, we can't have a former teacher and, and administrator here without thanking you for all of the years of service to our students in Forsyth County. So thank you. Thank I know you. the board wants to shake your hand. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. This time I'd like to recognize Dr. Amy Nail with a special recognition for pre uh, preparing future workforces in coding and mobile app grant. Yes, good evening everyone. The, the coding and mobile app development grant program, which was an initiative of State Superintendent Mark Johnson with funding from the General Assembly, provides support for two CTE business education teachers. This grant allowed us to add one position at Philo Hill Magnet Academy and one position at Mineral Springs Middle School. The purpose of the grant is to allow for the infusion of coding skills into the Computer Skills 2 curriculum this spring using new equipment and materials and teacher enhanced curriculum. The support provided by this grant will provide relevant hands-on experience and skills training for students it will also provide significant professional development for the teachers, which will prepare them to teach the new CTE coding course that will be introduced by the state for the 18-19 school year. Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools was one of 13 applicants selected from a pool of 35. We requested $45,000 in funding and received $28,000. It's my great honor to recognize the lead grant writer for this project, Dr. Shirley Bynum. Thank you so much, Shirley, for, for all that you do for our students and our staff for looking at ways uh, to enhance the CTE programs that we have. And we are very fortunate that here in winston salem Forsyth County, we have always been looked at very highly among the state for the CTE programs that we have. And we know that, that you're one of the reasons for that. So thank you very much and congratulations on the grant. While she's making her way, I'm going to ask her to, when we get this sort of up and running, to invite us over and let us uh, do a little coding. Absolutely. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> Great okay. idea. Thank yes. You. So that concludes our special recognitions uh, this evening. Do we have anyone? No. Okay, so we have no one signed up on um, agenda items. We will move right into our discussion items. First, um, Again, we amended the agenda, so I'd like to recognize Jonathan Wilson, our safety director in the district. In light of things that have happened recently, we thought it would, it's a good idea to just give a, a, an update and have a, some discussion around our school safety. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Emery and Board. Thank you, first off, for having me up here to speak tonight. Uh, um, especially under the circumstances, it's kind of tough. It's been a tough week. So first off, I want to say thank you for your commitment to uh, the safety and the security of our students. I've seen a, I've seen a lot of emotion this week, and um, some of that emotion was not, you know, it, it's not expected. But um, again, I just want to say thank you. Uh, your leadership is, is evident, and I appreciate it. Also, I want to take a minute to say thank you to our local law enforcement partners, Winston-Salem Winston Police Department, Forsyth County Sheriff's Office, and the Colonel's Police Department. 
I can tell you the, the two weeks that I've had, they have really had it. Uh, not a single time have we asked them a question that they've not stepped up and gave us an answer. <clears throat> they chased numerous rumors and things, that, uh, snakes in the corner, and every single time they've done so uh, tirelessly and without complaint. So I want to just begin by saying that our security um, plans are built, I think, on a strong foundation. Back in 2016, I think right before school started, we uh, completed and implemented our crisis maps, our critical incident maps, and those are individual plans for each of our schools uh, that give us a quick snapshot as to how to manage a crisis if one were to occur. And hopefully, we never, hopefully those maps will sit on a shelf and collect dust and we never need them, but if we do, then they're there. Uh, and I will say that winston Center for Side County Schools and our local partners in law enforcement, uh, we lead the state in this type of planning. I think that once we implemented our plans, the state implemented a plan that was similar to ours, although I think ours is a little bit better. Uh, this technology, um, this along with our technology that we already have in place, such as our cameras in every school, our Identikid visitor management systems where you go into a school and you sign in and get a badge, the A phones that we currently have in our elementary schools and our school resource officers that are currently in our middle and high schools are examples of, and they demonstrate, our multi-layered approach to our defending our campuses. And, and as you're aware, the bonds that were recently passed will add to this technology and help us fill in those gaps. Again, we're, we're extremely lucky to have great partnerships with our local law enforcement uh, partners. Uh, they provide our, our SRO program, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys know, but I want you to know tonight that not only are they working on a daily basis in our middle and high schools, that they're now assisting in our elementary schools as well. For example, Kernersville uh, Police Department pairs its middle school SROs with an elementary school. So that gives those schools a consistent law enforcement presence on their campus on a daily basis. The Forsyth County Sheriff's Office now has a roving, well not now, but they have a roving SRO that visits and supports the elementary schools within the county. And since January of this year, the Winston Atlanta Police Department has now directed its SRO corporals and SRO sergeants uh, to visit uh, city of Winston-Salem elementary schools as time allows and when needed. Uh, these are things that they're doing above and beyond what's in the contract. The contract doesn't even mention the elementary schools, but yet they're doing that. These officers are dedicated and do a great job not only patrolling our campuses, but they also serve uh, in building relationships with our students. And I just want to give you a couple of examples. Well, first off, let me say this. Tomorrow, the SRO leadership from all three agencies will be at central office uh, to be trained on our PBIS model. And the reason that we're doing that is because they, as well as we, want to reduce the negative interactions that, that students have with law enforcement and to increase those positive interactions. So these are just a couple of things that I just want to highlight that they're doing. They help, one of them helps coach uh, across country at Haynes. One of them coaches a girls softball team at Glenn. Uh, Officer Smith has Smith's All-Stars at Metal Arc where kids are, recognizing, where kids are recognized for doing something for others and doing a selfless act. Kingswood has a pen to cop uh, program where it's basically a pen pal program where officers write to students and students write to officers. High Five Fridays, you've all seen that with Chief Thompson going around to our elementary schools and, and building relationships with kids so that when they see the police officers, they think this is a great thing. In Kernsville, swag, students with accountability and growth, shop with a cop during the Christmas season and donuts for, <coughs> excuse me, donuts for bus behavior. And then our newest SRO uh, sergeant um, in Winston-Salem Police Department has come up with a new program proposal uh, that we're going to look at tomorrow. And it's, it's A4A, stands for Association for Appreciation, and that's going to fall right in line with our PBS model where it, on a larger scale, students are recognized for doing something positive within the school. So these are just a few examples of some things that, that I'm seeing around the district and I want to make sure that you guys are aware of. So since... Uh, the tragic events in Florida on, uh, on Valentine's Day, we, as a school system and security, have started reviewing and revisiting our emergency procedures to ensure that we're doing everything that we can and that we're leaving no stone unturned. 
Uh, we've asked that all principals reevaluate their campuses to ensure that all doors are locked in elementary schools and that that A-phone system is utilized the way it should be. Uh, that in middle schools, all but one door remains locked until those A-phones that are part of the bond are installed. And we've asked that all high school principals secu uh, secure every possible door with the exception of those that are absolutely necessary <coughs> in, uh, in order to operate e efficiently and effectively. And high school campuses, as we've all discussed, are, are very challenging. Uh, large structures, multiple buildings, though it is, it is a challenge. In 2016, uh, we rolled out the crisis manager app so that key staff and SROs would have emergency plans at their fingertips. And basically, they can pull out their phone. In case something happens, they can pull up that emergency uh, plans. Uh, they can pull up the map of the school, the crisis map that we talked about a few minutes ago, and they have that on the go. We're going to also revisit that to make sure that everyone, APs and principals across the district, have that on their phones. <coughs> Excuse me. SROs are in the process, and they're doing this on their own without prompting by myself. SROs are in the process of reviewing emergency plans with principals uh, to answer any questions that the principals may have and to ensure that everybody is familiar and on the same page. And this is in addition to their annual um, yearly assessments that they do at the beginning of each school year. Operations staff and the SRO leadership are meeting with the fire marshal tomorrow uh, to discuss fire alarms and the expectations uh, that they have, that the fire marshal has for schools in light of the events in Florida. And we're, re and we're also discussing what additional training may be needed and when may be the best time to conduct certain sessions. Finally, we're looking at the possibilities of additional tools and programs. And again, these are, these are thoughts and discussions, fact-finding missions that we're going, uh, looking into is a school uh, assessment app so that principals can have a, an app on their phone, go around their campus, and act forces them to look for vulnerable points on their campus. Uh, new technology in relation to social media. Additional construction features that could possibly be added to some of our facilities. Voice annunciation fire alarms for a potential recall, and hopefully I'll have more information from the fire marshal about that tomorrow. Access control on high school campuses. That's a way that we possibly can address some of those um, holes on those campuses and the feasibility of SROs in elementary schools. Again, I'll say these are thoughts and discussions, but these are things that, we're, that are running through our minds. And short of any additional steps, we're seeking the ability to prioritize the items provided by the bond so that the defense and, and the protection of our schools comes first. I think that this flexibility would allow us to uh, study and possibly implement some tools, try some pilots, uh, to, so that we make sure that the things that we need most uh, are, are put into place rather than moving in a direction that might not necessarily provide the things that we need. We want to be thoughtful in our response uh, and, and answering questions and not let emotion drive our decision-making process. So that's what I have for you tonight. I hope I answered some of your questions. I'm, I'm, I'm free to, to try to field some from up here if you would like. Board members, do you have additional questions for... Mr. Wilson, Ms. Parker. I assume since we're doing some you know, new construction and adding on to some buildings that every time we have a change in a building that we change that app, that's just a routine thing we do with the principals and with the, with the, um, the law enforcement agencies that you know, every time we. Yeah, any time that, that something has changed on that property, uh, then, then we will make a change or adjust our plans. Uh, yeah. Keeping that, I think you mentioned the app, so that oh, app itself yeah, is, a, is a bear to keep up to date, but we, we look at that as things come up. Okay, good. Thank you. Ms. Motzinger. As first, thank you so much, and thank you for the relationship that our district has with law enforcement, because I think it's good. I think it keeps getting better, yes, and I'm really glad to hear that. One thing that as board members, we keep getting letters from the public, and I would just like to emphasize that nothing you said talked about arming people in the buildings other than SROs, and I just wanted to make sure that. I will, I will have no opinion on arming anybody. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about your opinion. I'm just saying yes, that that yeah, is so that's, not a discussion. That's not even crossed my and mind. And yes, people keep sending us emails, yes. and I guess I would like to just communicate that that is not something you were discussing tonight. Or... That, would, that would be correct. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Ms. Calvert Hayes. You know, I really want to say thank you to you. I know that your work right now is extremely hard. And I know that you have a lot of people depending on you because of the love we have and the safety we have for our kids. So I want to say thank you to you, to the Sheriff's Department, to our SRO personnel, to the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Police Department for putting their life on lines for us. If you see a policeman out there or you see someone with that Sheriff's Department, don't forget to shake his hand because he's out there waking up every morning not knowing if he's going to come home to his family for every one of us sitting in this room, for every child that is sitting in our schools. So don't forget to let these men and women know what they're doing and what they're doing for us. And I especially want to say thank you for you because I can't imagine the week you've had. Thanks, John. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Dr. Emery? I did want to just add, because I know we've all gotten lots of emails, and I think to Elizabeth's point, it's important for folks to know that right now the statute does not permit anyone other than a trained official law enforcement officer to be armed on a school campus. And so um, we have laws that govern that. Um, as Jonathan said, I think as, as staff leaders, we're of a mind that if there were opportunities for our elementary schools to have those trained school resource officers, that would be something we would very much welcome discussing. But I, I think sometimes people don't realize that current legislation limits. So somebody isn't just going to come in tomorrow and say we're going to do something different. I mean, the, the statute is very clear. And um, I, I think sometimes that's helpful for people to have a little comfort while they watch um, things go on here. So I, I also wanted to add, we've done a lot of thanking. Um, I just want to say our high school and middle school administrators um, have been really boots on the ground this last two weeks, too. It's not just law enforcement. It's other folks in schools who run down these things, kids talk to them. And while this has been exhaustive, and I know it has been for Jonathan, one of the things I want to encourage, it is a strategy, and that is see something, say something. And the fact that parents are watching social media and reporting these things to our schools the fact that kids are telling someone at school while it's exhaustive, it is, it, it is keeping us safe. And I think the more we can encourage, um, talk to someone, if you hear something or see something, um, our students are really our best intel. And if they have relationships that encourage them to talk to an adult at school or their parents, um, that helps us tremendously in the work that we have to do sometimes to track this down. So I just, I just want to encourage folks to keep talking. Um, I know that we want Jonathan to rest and we don't want to wear out our, our law enforcement officials, but I see it as also a positive that people are, are sharing so much with us. Thank you, Dr. Emery. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. We appreciate the update. So next, I will recognize Victoria Fulton for the Office of Early Learning Plan.
Kevin. Oh, I think that might that might be it actually. I think, I think it's there it is. Yeah. Yep. Close the Got it. <laughs> So we, we don't have pressure on for technology. <laughs> it's coming. Is it coming? Okay. It's if not, we'll move on to one of our coming. committee reports. I think that's. <coughs> Yay. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Jones, Dr. Emery, members of the board. Um, as you all know, as I've come before you, several times now, my work with Project Impact really lives in pre-K through third grade um, and ensuring that our district's youngest students are on a path to success. I'm excited tonight to introduce Kelly Bendheim, who's our new early learning coordinator for the district and who's been a really incredible thought partner in tackling this work in the early grades. I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly now to introduce the Office of Early Learning and an overview of some of the initial planning we've done over the past few months. Thank you, Victoria, Chairwoman Jones, Board, Dr. Emery. Thank you for having me here this evening to share with you about the Office of Early Learning and some of the initial planning that we have begun as we begin to think about next steps in supporting our youngest learners. What I want to begin with is sharing with you the guiding principle that kind of is the underpinning of the Office of Early Learning. And what that is is our work revolves around preparing our schools, families, and community for success. So what early childhood and elementary educators know and what research confirms is that when children have quality early childhood experiences, they grow in their development in multiple areas. And that development is physical development, social emotional development, cognitive development, and of course, the important development of emotion regulation. And so what we know with that research is that it also involves a continuity of practice. So we have to look at how are we doing in the early learning years when we look at as these children transition from pre-K to K, K to one, one to two, and two to three. Because the combined impact of all of those forces as those children grow and develop through the years leads to what we know through research is an increased graduation rate as well as an increase in reading proficiency. And we know that both of those things are really important in the district. And that work begins in those foundational years of pre-K through second grade. Um, before I share any more specifics to the plan, I'm gonna let Victoria talk to you a little bit more about Project Impact and their connection with the work and within the Office of Early Learning and how they really are supporting the work that we're doing in the district. So I know you've seen me at this podium a number of times requesting approval and support for Project Impact's initiatives, and I thought it might be helpful for us to briefly zoom out and revisit the big picture behind Project Impact's funding priorities and how they align with the Office of Early Learning. So you'll see our two big key focus areas are non-proficient students and achievement gaps in pre-K through third grade, as well as intensive interventions among at-risk students and lower performing schools. Um, our funding priorities really revolve around three key strategies, pre-kindergarten expansion, extended and summer learning options, this is where your pathway to K and pathway to one live, and then expanded staff development and instructional support. And it's that last pillar that we're really gonna dig into tonight. So we have been so fortunate, thanks to the Project Impact Advisory Board and thanks to the support of all of you all, uh, to have done some really tremendous things in our first two years. I'm excited to, to share that we've added 14 classrooms in our first two years of, of pre-kindergarten. Uh, nearly 230 students who are previously on the wait list are currently being served. For our summer learning programs, we've served over 400 students to date in Pathway to K, and this summer we plan on serving another 200 in Pathway to K and an additional 180 in Pathway to One. But with expansion comes an increased need for support for our teachers, for our administrators, for our families, and for our community. 
And because Project Impact is a six-year initiative, our advisory board has challenged us to think strategically about what scale-up looks like and how we might meet the needs of students and teachers across the pre-K through third grade span over the life of Project Impact. So we have a really exciting opportunity to work closely with the Office of Early Learning to create that strategic vision. Um, an earlier version of this pamphlet that you have in front of you has been shared with the Project Impact Advisory Board, and with your blessing, we plan to take it to them in March to seek funding for these initiatives. Thank you. Um, keeping that guiding principle in mind, when Victoria and I met and met with several other thought partners to kind of think about what this plan might look, at, look like, we wanted to make sure that we kept it incremental in approach and additive. So we're beginning with our youngest learners with year one looking at pre-K and K and then how do we support those learners and then how do we support the educators that are serving them every single day. And then you'll see that we add first grade and then we add second grade. And within the plan, we're also focusing not only on the learners and the educators, but then the transitions in the family. So how do children transition from pre-K to K if they're coming from a pre-K outside of our district or a pre-K even within our district? What does that transition look like and feel like and how do we support families and welcome them into our district? That's really important. Um, another piece is that we have to look at continuous collaboration with our community partners, district and school leadership, and then the philanthropic community. We have lots of supporters that are um, supporting us financially and with services and resources within and outside of the district and we want to make sure we remain collaborative with them and we also need to make sure that we ensure that with the work that we are doing is in collaboration with and in support of programs and processes that are already in place in the district so the office of early learning is here to support the work that is happening and build on that foundation and grow it stronger And finally, for a few of the specifics, um, if you look at the strategic year-by-year -year scale up in the following areas, the icons that you're about to see match the ones that you have on your pamphlet with a few bit um, more details. So we begin by taking a look at staffing and capacity. Um, that began back in November with me, the creation of the early learning coordinator position. In, um, I'm honored to have the opportunity to serve in that capacity. We've also added a research and evaluation component to that, a new position um, that was approved, which is exciting because now we're able to really take a look um, at some longitudinal data and how our children are growing and thriving over the long term. What are the impacts of putting this strong emphasis on early learning? And then also we have a new pre-K program manager due to the retirement of a previous program manager. Um, that has been a seamless transition and one in which one retired and the next one was coming in within the next several days. So that has, um, that's been nice. The next area that we want to focus on is professional development and instructional support. Like I said, we're beginning with supporting um, our teachers who serve our youngest students in pre-K and K, looking at expanding that to first and then second grade. Um, the focus is truly on early learning pedagogy and then looking across the content areas and working on a framework um, that develops and guides classroom practice. So when we think about early learning and the pedagogy within early learning, it really is dynamic and it it's really um, differs with from pre-K to two. And it's really important that our educators have a strong understanding of what that pedagogy is and how they best serve our students. Um, and the final piece that we wanna look at in the final area are community outreach. And that serves multiple purposes. So again, we're looking at integrated support involving all partners, but we want to think about how are we supporting our students when they enter our classrooms? How are we partnering with families and parents when they join our classrooms and they join our schools? And we want to make sure we're kind of continuing to bridge that gap between school and home. Um, this work is so we don't only connect our families with community resources that we have out there, but we want to make sure that our educators know about resources that are in the community that they can offer up to families. So the community outreach piece too is um, it's kind of the heart of the work because it's what ties it all together, I believe. I think that's where we kind of triangulate families, homes, schools. Um, again, I just kind of want to end by saying a big thank you to the board, Dr. Emery, senior staff, community partners, and Project Impact um, for their dedication to ensuring that our early learners um, achieve great success and to making sure that this guiding principle of preparing our schools, family, and the community for success becomes a reality. So, if you have any questions at this time.
We'll give it a whirl. Questions, Board Mission, Ms. Parker? Well, under your community outreach, I was really excited to see Week of the Young Child. Yes. Um, that used to be a huge event in Winston-Salem that the area preschools did mm -hmm. a huge thing, and which I was a, a big part of. So I'm excited to see that. And I just didn't know whether you have, whether you're still in the planning stages of it or whether you have any, um, anything to share about this at that time. And also, if you're gonna, um, I assume, since it's under community engagement that you want, that you would um, would embrace the whole uh, Winston-Salem community into that week. Right, okay. correct. So you are correct. Um, the Week of the Young Child is a really exciting week for um, early childhood education and early learning. So being new to the position as of November, I've gathered a small team of three, and we're working really hard to create an initial excitement around this initial Week of the Young Child. And the um, NCAA US, um, they do a great job of providing resources, but in light of what you say, we're looking to expand that. So I'll be honest in saying year one, is kind of a growing and learning year. And so we want to make sure that our schools have resources, our families get resources, and we begin to outreach the community a little bit. But even within this group of three working together, we've already talked about possibilities for next year when we have a year of planning. How do we involve our community partners? How do we involve our local libraries? How do we involve our rec centers? And how can we develop some community-wide events that truly celebrate? So that is our long-term goal. Um, it might not look that way this year, but that's our goal to get there. Kelly, I, I bet that um, Ms. Parker, if you wanted any additional I know. members of that committee, may want to <laughs> may want to help you out. She's uh, very excited. I could I could tell. Board members, additional questions. Dr. Emery, comment. I just wanted to add. We uh, we we have sort of birthed this out of a need for a better alignment, and I really appreciate that Kelly and Victoria both mentioned that and the support of Project Impact. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the long-term partnership we've had with Kate B. Reynolds. And so part of this effort has also been launched out of that financial support. And we know their focus for a long time has been on the front end. How do we help with that? Um, a lot of strategic work on early, early childhood. And these three areas, I'm really excited because they line up directly with what KBR is doing um, from a community perspective as well. So I just wanted to mention that while we have multiple uh, sources of support here, they've been a, a longtime partner and continue to be in this work. And I don't know that we would have been able to launch the Office of Early Learning without their continued support. Thank you for pointing that out. We are truly blessed with community partners that make these things happen. So um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will have our Building and Grounds Committee report. Um, Ms. Lida Calvert-Hayes. Well, you'll be glad to know I'm not going to be talking about the sewer tonight or the uh, fire hydrant. But I do have something that I am going to be talking about that is exciting. We have been uh, meeting with the architect, and we are now moving along quickly for the Glen High School Stadium design. Uh, we will be asking the board for approval on that in August, and uh, hopefully we'll begin work soon on Glen High School, so we'll be all set for the activities that will be taking place there. Um, we also talked about our bond projects. Uh, we have a lot of bond projects going on right now. If you get a chance, please go to the website and check it out. I think you'll be surprised at the many different bond projects that we do have going on and also the progress of these projects that we have moving along very quickly too. And I say every time, if you get a chance to go by Thurman Street, and you get a chance to see uh, the new school that's going up. It's always exciting, and it seems to be going up fairly quickly also. So we feel great about that, and I think you would too if you ride by and see the progress that has been made on, on that school. Um, we, we also, of course, have talked several times, in fact, you're probably tired of hearing me talk about, the uh, Northwest Boulevard traffic. 
Well, we've kind of gotten that down now, and uh, we are going to be voting on that tonight. We have uh, plans, and like I said, we've talked about it and talked about it till we're blue in the face. But I hope that you will approve what's going on uh, that uh, our board is going to be voting on that tonight. And uh, that's something that's needed to be done for quite a while. So we're at the point we'll be voting on that tonight in our action items. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. If you have any questions on buildings and grounds, we certainly welcome it. And we look forward to all your enthusiasm as um, these schools, uh, our additions, uh, and things are moving ahead quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Singletary, the policy committee report. Madam Chairman, your um, policy committee met this afternoon and we discussed policy 8120, which is our school naming policy. This not only covers our schools, but it also deals with our gymnasiums, our stadiums, our auditoriums, media centers, and our music and band rooms. We've had discussions in the past on making sure that we had a policy in place that was both transparent and self-explanatory, especially to the community when they reached out to us with suggestions in how we would be naming these particular facilities. We did give suggestions to, um, to our um, legal team and they will be looking at that. They will be making revisions and hopefully at our next meeting they'll bring forward a um, actionable plan as well as a form that will be um, both user-friendly and pleasing for our community. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Um, curriculum committee report, Ms. Clark. Yes, yes. Uh, we covered, we had a great meeting, covered two uh, topics. The first, Andy Kraft, our Chief Program Officer of Accountability, stated that historically all eighth grade students have taken the eighth grade math, EOG, or end of grade test. And that's gonna be changing. And rather than give you all the details, I would just say to anyone who's listening out there, information is forthcoming, much communication will come down the pike, and it will become clear at that point. But that will be changing, and, and some of that's really good news. Um, the second topic was we talked about um, our gifted department in the district. And we heard from Kim Marion, who is now head over that for the district. We talked about um, screening. We, you know, she hit the highlights of how the plan for how we deliver those services to our children in the district, how that has changed over the last few years. And every th three years, we as a district are to revise our plan for services and submit that to the state. So over the last two years, we've been doing that. And she kind of hit the highlights for us as to what has changed. And she hit some um, points of interest. And I'll just mention a couple. We are um, we screen in the second grade for gifted services, and we are one of the maybe the Bev the the only one or Amy two in the state that do that. We deliver services in the third grade, and most other districts start in the fourth dra uh, grade. So those are two kind of I think positives for our district. Um, we talked about how the various ways are uh, the services are delivered. How, how children are grouped based on their um, identification. And then we, as always, is the best part of our curriculum committee meetings. We heard from uh, several teachers who are um, teaching those students. And it's always fun to hear from people who are in the field and actually doing the work. And so they talked with us about um, strategies that they use every day when they're teaching their kids and gave testimony as to the successes and the exciting things that they are seeing as they teach. Um, I want to just give a shout out to Kim Marion, who is relatively new. How many months has it been now, Amy? Six? Five? And then we also have added Donna Walker, um, who is the team, the lead middle school. Um, I don't know what you would call her. She's a guru, coach. Um, Wonderful. Anyway, so, and we'll be adding another person to the team as well, but my uh, kudos to both those ladies who have done a remarkable job in the last few months. It was a great meeting. Thank you, Ms. Clark. That concludes our discussion items for this evening. We have two action items on the agenda. Um, first, consider approval of plans and authorization to bid the Wiley Reynolds Traffic Study uh, Improvement Plan. 
Do I have a motion to approve? Ms. Calvert Hayes, do I have a second? Mr. Singletary, any discussion, board? If not, all in favor? Motion carries. Next, we have consider um, amendment to the Smart Start contract. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Ms. Mott Singer, second. Ms. Parker, any di discussion or questions, board members? If not, do I have a motion to approve? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So that concludes our action items. We have two um, consent agenda items, approval of meeting minutes for the February 13th, 2018 meeting and approval of the general personnel report. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Mr. Singletary, second. Mr. Johnson, all in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. We have um, several speakers signed up this evening. Um, first, um, <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Your School Channel, Cable 2.